In this video, we discuss how to use design systems. And I speak with the founder of Super Friendly, Dan Mall. Welcome to Out of Business. I'm Frederick Weiss, and our guest in this video, Dan Mall, co-founder and CEO of Arcade and founder of Super Friendly. Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Frederick. Happy to be here. Yeah, really happy to have you. Dan, if you can, could you provide a little bit of info about you, Super Friendly, and Arcade for the audience? Yeah, sure. I am a designer and a creative director and an advisor. I work on design systems through my agency, Super Friendly, which I've been running for about a decade. Um, as you mentioned, started some products to actually help with some of the client work that we do. Arcade is one of those things, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and mostly I like working with teams to help unlock them to do work in a more efficient way, a consistent way. and and honestly, just have more fun at work. Excellent. Thank you so much for that, Dan. And we'll go into super friendly and arcade a lot more in a little bit as we dive into our topic, which is how to use design systems. So first, I want to ask you what actually defines a design system? We know there's a lot of things like colors, typography, UI patterns, things to help organize rules for better digital products. There's a lot of interpretation that could be made here. I've heard you say things like Photoshop could be a design system, but I guess the answer depends on the company and the services or products they produce. But I guess to boil it down, my question is, can you identify any of the fundamentals that make up a design system? Yeah, totally. Uh I think when a lot of people think about design systems, they think about the parts, right? All the elements. So there are components and there are tools and there are UI kits and there are things. And I think one of the things I like to do with my teams is sort of redirect them a little bit to, into thinking about rather than the elements themselves, to think about the connections between the elements. And that's the way that that's the system part, right? Because otherwise they're just a bunch of separate things. It's how they come together in a connected way that makes it a system. So a lot of times I'm defining a design system as the, the smallest set of things that work together for an organization to make digital products. That makes sense. I think you could apply that in so many different ways, as I was saying earlier, depending on type of organization, et cetera. So let me ask you then, how does an organization identify if they are in need of a design system? You're doing these things over and over again. Here's a template for this and here's a way to document it. Is that a basic key indicator? Yeah, totally. That's a, it's a great start. The simplest version is that if you're managing two or more digital products, probably a design system is a good thing to start looking into. For companies that are working on the, you know, they have one website and that's it. Maybe it's not going to be as efficient, but once you get past one, you know, once you get into two or more, that's usually a good time to start thinking about that. So how does one sell the concept of a design system to their team and or stakeholders? Yeah, I think those are two separate concerns. Usually the people who are ICs, individual contributors on teams, so designers, engineers, product folk, writers, uh, UX people, they generally see the need for a design system before everybody else does. People who are the closest to the work uh, creating specifically digital interfaces, oftentimes they're like, we don't want to do this stuff over and over again. So they're already bought into the idea of a design system. Um, then the executive buy-in is, is a slightly different thing. A, a stakeholder buy-in is a slightly different thing. Um, most executives that I talk to through Super Friendly um, are bought into the idea of a design system, but they don't quite know what the details are. And I think what a lot of teams do that may or may not work uh, for a lot of teams is that they try to pitch a big initiative. We want to do a two-year effort that's going to span multi-millions of dollars and lots of different products. And that's what raises the hackles of executives where they go, well, hey, hang on a sec. Like, what, what exactly are we talking about here? So I think those two journeys are a little bit, they're parallel, but they're a little bit different in that somebody's got to sign a check either literally or metaphorically to say, yes, we bless this sanction of, you know, this many teams or these many people at our organization really focusing on a specific effort for the next couple of months or years. That being said, is there any kind of way to boil it down for the people upstairs, the C-level, the C-suite, as far as this is what this does and this is the value? I know that's a big question. Maybe things you could identify to communicate the, the value, if you will. 
Yeah, totally. So I think where this is one of the biggest pitfalls that I see teams commit with design systems is they think like, okay, if we could walk in with like our talking points, like we'll have ROI, we'll have, you know, here's the return on investment if we do this effort and this effort, and they try to pitch that and then they try to get some budget or some time approved or, you know, we wouldn't need to hire additional people for that. They try to go in and pitch that to executives. And I've seen that that is a hard case to make. So what I generally suggest is a little bit counterintuitive, which is that do it two or three times under the radar. Don't pitch it yet, right? Try mm -hmm. to find some side time to do it. It will require a little bit of, of investment from the team, you know, staying late after work a couple of days or a couple of nights, putting in some weekend time. You know, it, it might require some of that. It might require figuring out where there's some space within your sprint plans to do this. But if you can do that two times or three times to go like, let's work on products and then with those products, let's pull out some of the things that we could we think could be reused. And that could be common components that could be like the buttons and the cards and the footers and the header, or it could be things that like are less common, but actually make a big difference if we reuse those things. So yeah, we're going to use these thing, this thing once or twice, but if we use it once and make it reusable, then on the second time we save six weeks. After you do that two or three times, then go to your executive team and say, hey, we've been doing this kind of under the radar for the last you know, six weeks or eight weeks or 12 weeks or whatever that time frame is. And we have saved already a cumulative of two or three weeks here. Now, imagine if we did that times the number of, com of teams that we have at this company, times the number of designers and engineers and product folk, we would save $400,000 in the next year. And at that point, you're not pitching vaporware. You're basically saying, we tried a thing, now help us to scale it. As mm -hmm. opposed to going in and pitching vaporware, saying like, we have this idea for a thing. We have no idea it's going to work, but will you commit a lot of money to it? It's a hard pitch to make. So if you can already have some traction on it and say, we would like to continue this effort and we, we need your blessing and your funding and your, you know, all of that for it. It's a, it's a much easier case to make. It's not about these concepts, but if you show the actual proof, here's how much money we could save, et cetera, et cetera, based on real things, you're going to be able to sell this easier. Let me go back to the previous part of that question. So we talked about stakeholders, you know, the C-suite. Let's talk about teams. I want to read something that you put on LinkedIn the other day, which you were talking about shared language and how vocabulary is critical for things like this. So I'm just going to read one part and I want to ask you about it. So you're right here, the idea of documenting components felt daunting. This, this is a quote that you have in here. The idea of documenting components felt daunting and flat at best, boring and draining at worst. We outlawed saying we'd document components, in quotes, and instead we are saying chronicling the system. Now it's about capturing stories of how people are working. So I guess my question to that is, how does one make using and maintaining design systems a positive experience where people want to do this, where they want to chronicle? Yeah, I mean, this is part of my philosophy about design systems is that I think what a lot of people do with design systems, is they think about it as a library, you know? And so if you think about it as a library, basically you go like, if we build a handful of components that we design, you know, in Figma or we build in React or Angular, or, you know, whatever the flavor of the week is. If we build those things and we have enough of a good set of them, we have 50 or 100 or 20 or whatever the number is, and they are objectively good, the code is good, the design is good, then people will use it, right? And it's the, it's the whole like, if we build it, they will come mentality. <laughs> and yeah. as we know, that doesn't often work. Uh, and, and so a lot of teams that I work with have are, are usually on their third or fourth try on a design system by the time we start working. Them. And I call those design system graveyards. Right? It's like we tried it and we tried it that way. Um, what I think is fun and useful is rather than thinking about we're building a library, which is like most boring, you know, like libraries, you know, like there's only a certain type of nerd that loves libraries. I'm, I'm one of them, but like it's not appealing to everybody. Um, rather than thinking about it as a library exercise, think about it as a collecting exercise. What you're doing is you are going around the organization and you're plucking out the things that are already great that are going on. And I think there, you know, there's a certain kind of person that that kind of work appeals to people who want to innovate and people who want to like design new things and build new things by all means be on the feature teams, like create those features at your organization. But there are other people who are like, we want to systemize. We want to catalog. We want to collect. We want to highlight. We want to be inclusive. Those people are, are really great fits for a design system team where their job is 
to go around the organization and pluck these things out and go like that thing that that team made is really cool. And this other thing that this other team made is really cool. And then put them in a system. And when, if you do it that way, right, if, if the design system team shifts from thinking that they're creating some best practices for a team, but instead are just chronicling the stuff that is already happening that's really good, then it becomes an exercise of highlighting. Then it becomes about shining the spotlight on really great things that are already happening. And I think there's a there's a type of person that is activated by that kind of job and that kind of thinking is your job is to is to ele elevate people and their work. And I think that is one of the things that make it really fun is you're going around patting everybody's back. You know, like you're going around and saying, like, these are things that we think are really cool and we want to share it with everyone. We think that you, the thing that you made, we want everybody to be able to use that thing. And those are the kinds of things that I think uplift mm. an organization. I love that. So uh, getting that buy-in, making it not just your idea, but everybody's idea. You know, if, if everybody comes in and they put a little piece together of the mosaic and we have this beautiful picture, when you stand back, we could all look at it and say, we, we all did that. I own that. And we all have the influence to make this change within our organization kind yeah, of i like that yeah. metaphor yeah like I, i've never really thought about it that way but it's like rather than a design system team making their own painting instead they're weaving a tapestry of you know all of the stuff that comes from a bunch of places as opposed to it being centralized in that way i love that tell me what are some best practices of being able to maintain the quality of a design system over time what, what are some best practices to maybe set things up correctly at the beginning yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna punt on that question a little bit, or or at least sidestep sure. it. Please, please. In that I think quality is overrated, especially when it comes to a design system. And this is you know coming from a designer who went to design school, and you know craft is a is a high thing that I'm supposed to be tuned to. Um, I think that the nature of product design is that the quality could always be higher. You know, no matter how good the thing is or bad the thing is, I think that's the that's the job that we all have in making digital products is ship a thing, make it better later, you know, better and better over time. Um, digital product work is never done. And I think, you know, lots of teams say, oh, yeah, yeah, we understand that design systems are a product, but they don't live that out. You know, they don't actually practice it that way. Design systems are a product. So how do you set it up correctly from the start? You don't worry about it. It won't be correct from the start, no matter how much time you put into it. You could spend two weeks or four weeks or two months or four months or two years or four years. It just won't be correct from the start because it's about product market fit. You know, so it, like if, if this if this is about product, you know, and we're making product, product market fit is the thing that all startups try to try to aim for with their MVPs, with their minimum viable products. So it's right. more important that we make a thing that teams can use as opposed to we make something really good. And I think the teams that focus on we got to make something really good, they spin their wheels trying to do that. And it's never good enough. You know, like I, I can't tell you one team that I've worked with that are like, you know what? We nailed it. We could stop, you know, like ever. <laughs> uh, and, and so if we're going to adopt that mentality, well, instead, let's ship something something fast, you know, not in an irresponsible fast way. But let's let's make something fast that people can use and then make it better over time. You know, it's no surprise that material design has been around for, what, 10 years now. You know, yeah. and if you talk to the material design team, they're like, yeah, we still got work to do. You know, same thing with all the design system teams that are that are out there that are mature, been out there for many years. They still have work to do. So what makes us think, hey, we're going to start one today, but we're going to do it correctly, even though Shopify couldn't do it and Google couldn't do it and Salesforce couldn't do it. No, no, no. We're going to nail it on the first try. You know, it's a bit <laughs> of a naive mentality. Yeah, I, th I think that's all about the the process, getting it out there, learning from people, learning how they use it, because every organization is in their own bubble. And if, until you get that actual feedback from people, that's when you're going to go, aha, uh -huh. if you hold yourself back by trying to get perfection, you're never going to get off the ground. You won't get that input. And especially if good enough is never good enough to, to be good enough. There's no, totally. there's no such thing as perfection. Yeah. I mean, product design 101, right? It's like perfect yeah. is the enemy of done. I don't know who said that quote, but that's, that's highly repeated. So, you know, I try to put that into practice and in design system work. It's, it applies just as well. We're getting to the end here. I want to know more about super friendly. I assume 98% of the services are related to design systems, but what else does super friendly do? Yeah, you, uh, actually 100% of the of our services are related to design systems. So we are all in on design systems. And one of the changes we made about half a year ago is that um, we realized that when we make design systems on behalf of clients, even though we try to do as good of a, a job as possible, they just don't take root as well as we want, want them to. So we've switched to purely coaching. So we'll work only with, uh, with in-house teams and we will intentionally not bring 
production resources to the to the table. We can. I mean, we've built design systems before. We've designed them before. But a lot of times, you know, within a year or two years or something, the the, the organization will redesign it. And I think I, my hypothesis is that because it's just not made of them. You know, it's made of somebody else. It's some agency did it and dropped it off. And so it's not theirs. And so the new hypothesis is how can it be theirs? And could that allow and, and lead to some more longevity of that product internally? So we are doing only coaching. We bring coaches to the table and we work with fully staffed in-house design system teams or what eventually will be a design system team and really just coaching them on the practices of, of how to do this. So how does that differ from your other company, Arcade? So Arcade is a straight up product company, right? Arcade is selling a service. Um, we are early in that and it is um, it is like basically an, an alpha phase. We have some early testers using it, so really early. But Arcade is basically a design token management product. Um, and that's a thing that we're still working out the business model and the pricing structure for all of that. But basically that's a thing that you would pay some sort of monthly, annual, you know, something fee to use this product that does a specific thing. So while Super Friendly is the consulting services side of all of this, we'll help teams do it on their own. Arcade is about, we need to do a specific thing and we're willing to buy a product to, that actually does that and make that easier for our team. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dan. I just have two questions for you here, which is first, where can people find out more about you, Arcade and Super Friendly? Yep, I've got a, a couple of places. So one is on Twitter. I tweet random things. I'm Dan Mall on Twitter. Um, I tweet about design, about design systems, about my daily Wordle score, you know, all sorts of, of different things. Uh, DanMall.com is another place where I write uh, infrequently and also SuperFriendly.com um, right there too, uh, as well as has some more information about our services and our work and things like that. Lastly, Dan, if you could provide the audience with some closing words of wisdom. There's lots of people out there that need help. Um, so if you can spare five bucks or 500 bucks or whatever, um, donate to something that is important to you because lots of people need help. That could be on a global scale. That could be on a local scale. So find something that's important to you and your family and uh, support the cause. Excellent. Dan, thank you so, so much for being on the show. Super appreciate it. Absolute pleasure. Absolute honor. Can't thank you enough. Frederick, thanks for having me. This is great. It was fun. Thank you so much.